Hello everyone. How are you doing today? I hope your day is going well. In today's lecture, I'm going to review and summarize the method of work and energy, and the method of impulse and momentum. There are the learning outcomes for today's topic. At the end of the topic, the student would be able to define the work of a force, solve the motion of particles using the method of work and energy, solve the motion of particles using the method of impulse and momentum. In the preceding chapter, you solved problems dealing with the motion of a particle by using the fundamental equation F equals ma to determine the acceleration A. By applying the principles of kinematics, you could then use acceleration to determine velocity and displacement of the particle at any time. In this topic, we combined F equals ma and kinetic energy relationships to obtain an additional principle called principle of work and energy. This eliminates the need to calculate the acceleration and enables you to relate the velocities of the particle at two points along its path of motion. Later, on the other half of this topic, we consider a third basic method for the solution of problems dealing with the motion of particles. This method is based on the principle of impulse and momentum that had been integrated Newton's second law to derive it. This method can be used to solve problems involving force, mass, velocity, and time. In the first half of the chapter, we studied the method of work and energy and its applications to the analysis of the motion of the particles. We first considered a force F acting on a particle A. And defined the work of F corresponding to the small displacement dr, as the quantity du equals F dot dr. Or recalling the definition of the scalar product of two vectors, as F multiple ds cos alpha. Where alpha is the angle between F and dr. We obtained the work of F during a finite displacement from A1 to A2, denoted by U1 to 2, by integrating along the path described by the particle as U1 to 2 equal to integration from A1 to A2 F dot dr. And for a force defined by its rectangular components, we wrote U1 to 2 equal integration A1 to A2 in bracket Fx dx plus Fy dy plus Fz dz. Work is a scalar quantity, that is, it has magnitude and sign but not direction. Dimensions of work are length times force. Units are newton meter or joule. When the force F is identified by its rectangular component, as described before, we can use the equation to derive formulas for the work done by a force in several common and important situations or case. The first situation is when a particle moving in a straight line is acted upon by a force F of constant magnitude and of constant direction. Formula yields U1 to 2 equal to F cos alpha multiply with delta X. Where, alpha equals angle the force forms with the direction of motion, and delta X equals displacement from A1 to A2. Next we also can obtain work of the weight W of the body. That is, of the force of gravity exerted on that body. By substituting the components of W into rectangular component. This give us DU equals negative W dy. Or, U1 to 2, equals negative W multiply Y2 minus Y1. Where this equation shows that. Work of the weight is equal to product of weight W and vertical displacement delta Y. Note that the work is positive when delta Y is negative, that is, when the body moves down. Next situation is, when a body A attached to a fixed point B by a spring. We assume that the spring is undeformed when the body is at initial position as shown in the figure. For a linear spring, the magnitude of the force F exerted by the spring on body A is proportional to the deflection X of the spring measured from the unstretched position. Then, we can obtain the work of force F exerted by the spring during a finite displacement of the body from A1 to A2 by writing 
U1 to U2 equal 1 over 2 kx1 square minus 1 over 2 kx2 square. Where k is the spring constant and x1 and x2 are the elongations of the spring corresponding to the position a1 and a2. Note that, work of the force exerted by spring is positive when x final less than x initial, that is, when the spring is returning to its undeformed position. Last situation is, you will find that gravitational force also does work. When two particles of mass m1 and m2 separated by a distance r attract each other with equal and opposite forces f and negative f, directed along the line joining the particle. By assuming that particle m1 occupies a fixed position o, while particle m2 moves along the path as shown in the figure. Then, we can obtain the work of force F exerted on particle M during a finite displacement from A1 to A2 using given equation 13.7 in the textbook. A force said to do work if, when acting, there is a displacement of the point of application in the direction of the force. Here is some forces frequently encountered in kinetics problems do no work. They are forces applied to fixed points or acting in a direction perpendicular to the displacement. Forces that do no work include The reaction at frictionless pin supporting rotating body The reaction at a roller moving along its track The reaction at frictionless surface when body in contact moves along surface, and The weight of a body when its center of gravity moves horizontally Work is closely related to energy. The work energy principle states that an increase in the kinetic energy of a rigid body is caused by an equal amount of positive work done on the body by the resultant force acting on that body. From Newton's second law, we derived the principle of work and energy, which states that we can obtain the kinetic energy of a particle at final position, by adding its kinetic energy at initial position to the work done during the displacement from initial to final position by the force exerted on the particle as T1 plus U1 to 2 equal T2. The units of work and kinetic energy are the same which is Newton meter or, Chow. The method of work and energy simplifies the solution of many problems dealing with forces, displacement, and velocities, because it does not require determination of accelerations. We also notes that it involves only scalar quantities, and we do not need to consider forces do no work. However, this method should be supplemented by the direct application of Newton's second law to determine a force normal to the path of the particle. Note that, principle of work and energy cannot be applied to directly determine the acceleration of the particle. To solve a problem using work and energy, you need to follow these steps. First, compute the work of each of the external forces. The work U1 to 2 can be easily evaluated in the following cases that you will encounter, that includes Work of a constant force in rectilinear motion Work of the force of gravity Work of the force exerted by a linear spring Next, calculate the kinetic energy at position 1 and position 2. Finally, substitute the values for the work done U1 to 2 and kinetic energies T1 and T2 into the equation. You may refer examples for vector mechanics for engineers, dynamics textbook, 12th edition, written by Beer et al. 2020. The principle of work and energy is useful for solving many different types of engineering problems. However, in many engineering application, the total mechanical energy remain constant, although it may be transformed from one form into another. This is known as the principle of conservation of energy. To formulate this principle, we must first define a quantity of potential energy. Potential energy is a measure of the amount of work a conservative force will do when a body changes position. When the work of a force, F is independent of the path followed, the force is said to be a conservative force, and its work is equal to minus the change in the potential energy, V associated with F. The work is negative when the change in the potential energy is positive, which is when V2 greater than V1.
the potential energy V of the body associated with a conservative force F, includes the potential energy with respect to force of gravity. The potential energy of the body with respect to the force of gravity, denote as Vg, can be evaluated with W multiply with Y. The function WY has been used to obtain the work done by W by subtracting the value of the VG corresponding to the second position of the body from its value corresponding to the first position. This expression of the potential energy of a body with respect to gravity is valid only as long as we can assume the weight, W of the body remains constant. Gravitational Force In the case of a space vehicle, we need to take consideration the variation of the force gravity with the distance r from the center of the Earth. Therefore, we can obtain the potential energy of a body due to force, also denoted as Vg, by negative gmm over r, or negative wr power 2 over r. Elastic force exerted by a spring. The potential energy of a body with respect to an elastic force, denoted by V can be obtained from half kx square. This function has been used to obtain the work of the elastic by subtracting the value of the function VE corresponding to the second position of the body from its value corresponding to the first position. Units of work and potential energy are the same, newton meter or joule. Friction forces are not conservative. Total mechanical energy of a system involving friction decreases. Overall. There are two major components to V commonly encountered in mechanical systems, the potential energy from gravity and the potential energy from springs or other elastic elements. We saw in the preceding two section that we can express the work of a conservative force, such as the weight of a particle or the force exerted by a spring, as a change in potential energy. When a particle moves under the action of conservative forces, the principle of work and energy stated earlier can be expressed in a modification form. Substituting U1 to 2 into work and energy method we have T1 plus V1 equals T2 plus V2. This formula indicates that when a particle moves under the action of conservative forces, the sum of kinetic energy and potential energy remains constant. This principle is called the principle of conservation of energy. In this example you will see how we can check that the total mechanical energy E equals T plus V of the pendulum remain constant. Whereas the energy is entirely potential at A1, it becomes entirely kinetic at A2, and as the pendulum keeps swing to the right past A2, the kinetic energy is transformed back into potential energy. Because the total mechanical energy of the pendulum remains constant and its potential energy depends only upon its elevation, the kinetic energy of the pendulum must have the same value at any two points located at the same height. Thus, the speed of the pendulum is the same at A and at A'. prime. To solve a problem using principle of conservation of energy, you need to follow these steps. First, determine whether all the forces involved are conservative. Next, set the datum. The datum can be defined at any convenient location. Vg is positive if y is above the datum and negative if y is below the datum. Next, calculate the kinetic energy at each end of the path. Then, compute the potential energy for all the forces involved at each end of the path. Such as, the potential energy of a weight W close to the surface of the Earth and at a height Y above a given datum or the potential energy of a body with respect to an elastic force F equals Kx. Finally, substitute the values for the kinetic energies T1 and T2, and potential energies V1 and V2 into the equation. We now consider a third basic method for the solution of problem dealing with the motion of particles. This method is based the principle of impulse and momentum. The principle of impulse and momentum describes how an object's linear and angular momentum change with applied forces and moments. This principle can be used to solve problems involving force, mass, velocity, and time. It is particular interest in the solution of problems involving impulse motion, and impact. 
we integrated Newton's second law to derive the principle of impulse and momentum of particle. We can express Newton's second law in the form F equal to D over DT MV, where MV is linear momentum of the particle. Multiplying both sides of that equation by DT and integrating from a time T1 to a time T2, we have equal to MV2 minus MV1. Moving MV1 to the left side of the equation give us the relation for the principle of impulse and momentum express as MV1 plus integral of the force with respect to time equals MV2. The principle of linear impulse and momentum in vector form is written as MV1 plus integral of the force with respect to time equals MV2. Where MV1 and MV2 represent the momentum of the particle at time T1 and time T2, respectively, and where the integral defines the linear impulse of force during the corresponding time interval. Then, we have linear momentum at T1 plus linear impulse during time interval equals linear momentum at T2 which express the principle of impulse and momentum for a particle. The two momentum diagrams indicate direction and magnitude of the particle's initial and final momentum, MV1 and MV2. The impulse diagram is similar to a free body diagram, but includes the time duration of the forces acting on the particle. This diagram should be included in U problem solutions. Because the equations involve vector quantities, to obtain an analytical solution, it is necessary to consider their x, y, and z components separately. The method of impulse and momentum is particularly effective in the study of the impulsive motion of a particle when very large forces, called impulsive forces, are applied for a very short interval time delta t. When the average value of force exerted on the particle is very large, and the resulting impulse of the average forces is large enough to change the sense of motion, the impulse and momentum principle for impulsive motion becomes linear momentum at T1 plus impulse of average forces equals linear momentum at T2. We neglect any force that is not an impulsive force because the corresponding impulse of the average forces is very small. To solve a problem using principle of impulse and momentum, you need to follow these steps. First, establish the X, Y, Z coordinate system. Next, draw the particle's free body diagram and establish the direction of the particle's initial and final velocities, drawing the impulse and momentum diagrams for the particle. Show the linear momenta and force impulse vectors. Finally, resolve the force and velocity, or impulse and momentum, vectors into their x, y, z components and apply the principle of linear impulse and momentum using its scalar form. Please noted that, when forces as functions of time must be integrated to obtain impulses, if a force is constant, its impulse is the product of the force's magnitude and time interval over which it acts and if the time interval is very small and the force is very large. The force is called an impulsive force and its impulse over the time interval T2 to T1 equals T is equal to F average multiply with delta T. As a conclusion, it has three different approaches to the analysis of the motion of particles, which are includes. Newton's second law. This method can be used to directly determine forces or acceleration. Work and energy method. The method of work and energy is dealing with a problem that related to forces, displacement and velocities. Impulse and momentum method. This method can be used to solve problems involving force, velocity, and time. This is the list of references that have been used for this course. That's all for today. Thank you for your attention. If you have any question, Please write down your comment via open learning or telegram groups. We will respond as soon as possible. Last but not least please fill up the exit ticket for attendance for this week. Have a good one. Bye.